Good morning. Wow, we've got a few survivors out there anyway. Yeah, how how you guys doing? I gave up after the second party. How about you? All right, so I'm going to talk about sustainability. And this is something I've been thinking about for quite a while now. Uh, I've had a lot of conversations about it. I've shopped this presentation stack around to a lot of people. And we've also been convening some meetings. O'Reilly helped us convene a meeting in San Francisco in April. Um, We're working very hard to try to make this a real thing. Um, Why am I worried about that, you might ask? Well, first of all, you've heard it before, we are made of win. We totally won. And I'm here to tell you that when when we started, we didn't know we were going to win. In fact, there was a pretty good chance we weren't going to. So it means a lot that we got this far. However, this comes with some interesting implications. We have a complete influx of new, newness coming in, new companies, new people, and they are looking at different things than we looked at. They take the transparency of the code kind of for granted. They assume that this is how, you know, that open is how you do things, but um, they're very interested in collaboration and, and focusing on optimizing for collaboration, which I think is going to be really helpful and useful. However, they're not battle-tested, right? They, they didn't go through the wars that we went through. And I don't really want to say get off of my line to these people because, honestly, I think, you know, they're going to bring a lot to the, to the table. But I do kind of feel like I have to talk a little bit about what went before before we get to the things that I think we have to pay attention to now. So, first of all, we in the open source movement, whatever, the OG open source movement, I guess we'll call it, um, and even before that, the OG free software movement, we were, we were there for the passion, You know, money's nice, but really we were there for the passion. And I find that the newcomers are very interested in in watching the money. Um, I had, Kelsey and I had a conversation early on where he said, well, that's very nice what you're saying, but aren't you going to piss off the VCs if you do that? (laughs) I was like, oh, honey, the VCs will figure out how to work with us. That's not the, you you got it wrong. You know, (laughs) you you don't understand your power. So that's what I want to talk about today. They don't know when to push back and they got to learn that. They got to learn that because that is kind of our job, okay? So first, a little history lesson. We do stand on the shoulders of giants. You guys have been hearing that all week. This is a little quiz, so go ahead and shout out if you think you know who these people are. Anybody know this one? These are the grandfathers of free and open source software. Nobody? That's Bill Joy. He wrote BSD and and first published it as code in 1977. So, goes back quite a ways, and later founded Sun Microsystems. Uh, Anybody? Yeah, that's Richard Stallman. He wrote the GPL in 1985. So, a long time before we ever talked about open source, he was there. Larry Wall, who's been wandering around here. This was a Perl conference long before it was an open source conference, and you got to know that, right? Anybody? Thank you. This is Ian Murdoch, who we lost this year. Um, and he, of course, started the Debian project, the first you know, full stack of Linux that, that was useful. And it's still a, a going project today. This is Brian, Brian Bellendorf, who helped me understand open source. And he was so generous. He was, he was you know, in his 20s, put up with me and helped me understand the whole ball of wax back in the day. Anybody? That's Mitchell Baker. How many of you know that Mitchell Baker was fired by AOL because she was sticking up for the community and she dusted herself off and went home and kept running the project and all of the engineers kept deferring to her? (laughs) That's an act of courage. And of course, Tim O'Reilly. And when I was shopping this, there were some people who thought Tim didn't belong in the stack. But honestly, I think Tim gave all of us a platform to discuss and grow and learn how to do this together. And, um, you know, I don't think that we can actually underestimate his contribution to the whole thing. So there you go, a timeline. Notice that the green keyhole doesn't come until pretty late in the first era, right? So a whole bunch of stuff happened before that green keyhole. Also interesting that a lot of those projects were projects and later became foundations, which I think is really interesting. All right, now I want to, this is one more giant, but you probably don't know him. Does anybody know who this is? This is Josh Burkus, who works on Postgres. 
And um, he did a very brave thing while he was working for Sun. About 10 years ago, he wrote an article that you can read today, it's still sitting there, and I didn't put, give you the URL because you can just type that and you'll get it, um, that he basically told his employer and all the other companies how they were screwing up, right? And, and it's a list of things that were big topics 10 years ago, like <sighs> don't talk down to the community, don't use stupid tools, don't go silent, don't make decisions behind closed doors, lots of things that we all know sort of instinctively now, but this was very edgy when he did it, right? So now we're going to switch and start talking about the fact that corporations must optimize for profit by law if they're traded publicly. You just have to accept that about them. Know that. They also really like to massage a message. So you're going to hear them say hyperbolic things like, um, now blockchain is open source because of us. Or, you know, there's a bunch of stuff like that. Um, and you have to take all that stuff with a grain of salt, call it out if you think it's outrageous, all right? Even some of our best friends have to be reminded from time to time who, who put them here. So I actually love Red Hat, I'm not trying to pick on them, but it's an interesting story that they didn't know that they had to offer RHEL in source code. Even though it's clearly in the licenses, they thought that they could get away with just Fedora Core. And somebody very helpfully in the community reverse compiled RHEL and put it up as CentOS and taught them, you know, schooled them a little bit, right? I think that open source is already a masterpiece and doesn't actually need editing so much. However, we could use more diversity and we could stand to be nicer to each other. But in general, I think that the 20 years that we've been doing it, it's kind of stood the test of time. I'm going to be interested to see what the new emphasis on collaboration does, but I think there's some important stuff to remember so that we don't allow erosion of the, the gains that open source brought us, okay? Whoops. So before there was open source, the job of being a programmer was kind of grim. You know, it really was. I mean, back in the hobbyist day, it wasn't, but by the time I came into it, it was a lot of really grim work and not a lot of joy. And I feel like open source really brought joy into the, into the equation. And I don't want to forget that. This is Joe Hill, who was actually um, helpful to the coal mining strikes and the turn of the last century. And the reason I have his slide in here is because I want you to know what he said as his epitaph. He said, a lot of people will fall in this battle that we're in. Don't mourn for me, organize, okay? You guys are superheroes. You don't realize it, but you're superheroes. You, the, the business can't happen without you. You are the one, you know, <laughs> indispensable resource. Marketers, lawyers, all that other stuff, doesn't matter. You guys, they have to keep, they have to make happy. And so you have a power that you don't realize you have. But you can stand in that power and you can keep open source sustainable by doing that. Okay, so here's a little Rosetta Stone of the six things I'm most worried about and a couple of others that I'd like you to think about. First of all, transparency is not negotiable. There is no open source without transparency. And that means board meetings have to have minutes published. That means that um, uh, decisions have to happen by consensus transparently. It means that donors have to be disclosed. It means that if you make a decision, it needs to be archived so that people can find it later and figure out what happened 10 years later, five years later, when they need to know. If you get involved with a project and you see lack of transparency, you've got to call it out. That's your job. Open source is people. I've been saying this for a while now, so you guys have heard this before. What this means is if you are working in a situation where you have a commit bit that is corporate that you're being hidden under, that's not open source. Corporations are not people in open source. They might be good places to work if they're nice to their open source developers, but you, it's up to you guys to say, no, I get my own reputation because it needs to be portable. When you leave that company, what you did there needs to be available so that your next employer can see how you code, so that people can find you to ask you questions if they need to. So this is really important because we're seeing companies that don't get this and think they have a special reason why they need it the other way. Companies like to use their resources as like pieces on a chessboard. And that's important for you to know. I have been watching large deep pocket companies 
investing massive resources in certain open source projects and then divesting them later when the strategy doesn't work out. I've never seen it good come out of it for the project itself. So when you see that happen, you got to know that's not good, okay? I'm going to teach you a word. Everybody know this word? Fungibility. That means that you are replaceable by somebody else who could do the job just the same as you. Sorry, I had to get a juggling metaphor in there. And that's not a good thing because open source people are not so fungible. We just aren't, right? <clears throat> so it's important to keep that in mind. If you're working for a company that's treating you like a fungible resource, you got to call that out. Back in the day, open source people would tell you, even working for some of the biggest companies in the world, that if their boss told them that they had to leave a project that they were emotionally attached to, they would quit rather than leave. And sometimes it takes that kind of action. I want to say that the tragedy of the commons is a real thing. Okay? The, the grass really will die if you don't keep watering it. One of the best ways to water it that companies forget about is patronage. That's where you let your employees work on stuff pro bono that maybe you don't care about so much, right? So I serve on a number of boards. If I go to work for a company that doesn't care about those projects, that doesn't mean I'm going to stop working on that project. They have to understand that coming in the door. A lot of people build their reputation in open source through this kind of work. It has to be allowed because it's key. Money changes everything, as you know. I actually think money is okay in open source. I'm a little worried about what happens if there's, you know, like a major downturn and companies or are, are, um, foundations are expecting, counting on money that might go away. I will say I think pay-to-play boards are dangerous. And I'm on one, right? I'm, I'm totally on one. <laughs> I'm the chairman of the Node.js Foundation. But I went to a lot of trouble to make sure that there would be community participation in the board through an election. Basically, you need to be able to get access to every level of a project by your sweat equity, or it's not open source, in my opinion. And last, technology has to come first. A lot of projects happen because the funder wants their technology to win over some other technology as a strategy play, instead of it being the best technology winning. And you got to call that out when you see it, too. Okay. This particular argument that has been going on for 20 years needs to stop. I am just as attached to my side of this argument as everybody else out here, and you know which side you live on, but those new people coming in the door, this bores them, and they go to sleep, and they don't want to pay any attention to it, and then you get into the, I'm not going to choose a license mess, which we don't want to go there. You know, projects need licenses. We need to walk away from this, just decide we're basically on the same side at this point, I believe. So I used to run the OSI, helped run it for 10 years, and that doesn't mean that I don't love free software. I do fund the Free Software Foundation as well. But I want to say that the OSI picked up the work of talking about sustainability. And so if this is interesting to you, go get your membership in OSI and then go to this place, which you don't have to write this down because you can just Google for um, open source initiative and beyond licensing and you'll find this discussion. This is them beginning to codify. Maybe they won't pick the six that I just gave you, but coming up with things beyond copyright that must be present for it to really be open source. I think we're in a position to do this now. I think we have to do it now. So um, this is my corporate master. Just wanted to give you that little moment of thank you for letting me be here, PayPal. Um, these are the topics that we're prepared to talk about in our booth. And we have experts in all of them. If you want to come by, we'll also teach you how to juggle. And uh, if you come by quick, you can still get a ticket to the Ghostbusters movie tonight at the Alamo Draft House. Thank you so much for listening.